Welcome to the next in our guest speaker series. Uh, the format, as you know, is, is roughly half an hour for the talk and, and the remaining time allowed for questions and discussion. Uh, we're a company which is a spin out from Oxford University. Our method is used for analyzing uh, a brain MRI uh, based on changes in cellular structure. So we're working with drug developers, biotechs, um, and towards making a tool available for clinicians so that they can correctly uh, classify, identify, and detect Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, which of course is a big part of, of what you'll talk to us about today. So we're very grateful that, that Professor Jennifer Whitwell has been able to join us as guest speaker today. Um, uh, she's from the UK originally and studied in the past here in Oxford, uh, and then for your PhD, I gather, in London at UCL before you cross the pond uh, to where you are now professor and associate consultant in radiology and co-lead of the neurodegenerative research group at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester in the USA. Uh, and uh, Professor Whitwell will talk to us today about multimodal imaging in progressive supranu supranuclear palsy uh, and perhaps a discussion we might also consider biomarkers of uh, dementia and, and related diseases more broadly for use in clinical practice. Great. Get that. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, it's um, really nice to be able to talk to you guys today. And thank you for inviting me and also to bring a little bit more recognition to PSP because um, it's, uh, it's a disease close to my heart and I've been studying it for a number of years now. So I'll uh, really talk to you about what we what we find on imaging in PSP and what are the latest things that we're looking at in the fields and what are some of the challenges. Oops, I probably should close my email. I'm sorry about that. So I don't have anything to disclose. So PSP is a neurodegenerative disease, much in much like Alzheimer's disease in that sense. That's about where the similarities end. Um, it's characterized by deposition of a protein called tau, a 4R tau in the brain. So we consider PSP a primary tauopathy. It's really coming from the protein tau in the brain. The typical clinical presentation of PSP um, it really involves the body. This is a movement disorder, whereas Alzheimer's disease is really a, a disorder affecting the cognition. This is a movement disorder. Patients have prominent and early imbalance and falls, meaning when they're walking, they're very, um, they're very imbalanced when they're walking they, and they're going to fall, an unprovoked fall when they're just walking along or when they're doing things around the home. So they'll have a history of falling. They have something called Parkinsonism. And for these patients, they really have a slowness, um, slow movements in their body. They have rigidity of their limbs. So it's really affecting their whole body. And they have these characteristic abnormalities with their eyes. Um, so if you are just trying, you keep your head still and you try to look up, look down, look left and look right. Those are your eye saccades as you're moving your eyes. And these patients have slowing of those eye saccades. And eventually they'll have a, a complete, vert, what we call a vertical nuclear gaze palsy. So they cannot move their eyes up and down and left and right. That's one of the things that clinicians assess when they assess these patients, how well can they move their eyes. Um, this typical presentation that I'm describing with the falls, the eye abnormalities, the Parkinsonism, that's referred to as PSP Richardson syndrome. And, and later in the talk, I'll talk about some other variants of PSP because of course it gets more complicated than that. Um, these patients can have cognitive dysfunction, um, but typically later in the disease. Because this is a disease that's affecting the body, these patients end up wheelchair bound. They can't walk in the ends, they're, they're completely wheelchair bound. They develop swallowing problems, which often leads to aspiration pneumonia and, and subsequently death. And they have a disease duration of about six to seven years. Um, the prevalence uh, estimates are a little un uncertain, really, but it could be anywhere between five to 17 people per 100,000. So, for example, maybe there's an estimate of 20,000 people in the US currently have PSP. So how does this differ from Alzheimer's disease? Well, it differs um, pathologically and clinically, and it also differs a lot on brain imaging. So pathologically, Alzheimer's is, just, is defined, as you, I'm sure you know, by two main proteins, tau and beta amyloid. Um, and the tau in Alzheimer's disease is different from the tau that we're seeing in PSP. So in PSP, we have this four repeat tau. So they have four um, repeats in the binding domain of the tau protein. But in Alzheimer's disease, we see a mixture of both three and four repeat tau in the brain. And we also see a different morphological characteristics of the inclusions, the very different types of tau, and the distribution of tau is very different in the brain. And of course, PSP is not defined by beta amyloid. So pathologically, they're very distinct diseases. That isn't to say patients with PSP don't sometimes develop some features of, of Alzheimer's disease, especially in older patients, but that's for another day, probably. Just think of them as two distinct pathological disorders. 
Um, clinically, they're very distinct too. Alzheimer's disease is defined by cognitive impairments. So you have your, your memory, particularly your memory declines, but also other types of cognitive impairments, language, visual spatial perceptual deficits, executive deficits. But it's really all cognitive deficits that are stemming from damage to the cortex. And I think what you'll see in PSP is that we're seeing very different patterns of damage to the brain than we see in Alzheimer's disease. There we go. Figuring out what to do there. So, uh, PSP has some very characteristic patterns of atrophy on MR, um, which I'm showing on this slide. So, on the left, um, this is a sagittal MR image through the brainstem. So, this is the midbrain here and the pond here. And what we see in PSP is dramatic loss of the midbrain right here. So, this is three control subjects on the top left and three PSP subjects. So you can see reduction here in this midbrain and it sort of looks like starts to look like it has a little beak so it's called the hummingbird or the and can be called the penguin sign of PSP and it's very characteristic this shrunken midbrain with this little beak um, poking up. We also see atrophy of um, the structure is called the superior cerebellar peduncle in PSP and that's shown in this image down here can you see I don't know if you can see my pointer uh, or not but it's in ENF <laughs> I think Possibly. you can get a pointer by um, clicking the three dots to the left and below the slides and then I think there's an option to change it to a, a laser pointer and then we'll be able to see that. Otherwise we can't see the cursor normally I don't think. Huh. Uh, I do not see that. So maybe um, I'll just carry on in the interest okay. of not messing it up. Sure. Hang on a minute. I've opened something else now. Oh no. Can you see my slides still because I've just done something? We can see everything fine still. OK, let me double click here. Maybe this is the problem. Oh, wait, I'm back. OK. Um, so anyway, ENF. So it's these little white matter tracks here that actually stem out from the cerebellum. So you can see them here and here. This is a healthy control in F. And you can see the little red lines, actually. So that's you can see we're measuring a width of the superior cerebellum pedicle there. And on, in E, these little white matter tracks that project up from the cerebellum are severely degenerated. So these are two features on MR that are really quite characteristic for PSP. And a lot of work has been done looking at, well, what measurements can we do of these structures and how well do they work clinically, like diagnostically for patients with PSP. So in, in A and B on the right side of the slide, you can see one thing people do is look at the area measurements of the midbrain and the pons. We also do volume measurements now of the, of the midbrain, although honestly, some of, sometimes these area measures work better than doing a volume measure. Um, people do measure the width of the superior cerebellar peduncles, and they measure the width um, here of the middle cerebellar peduncles in comparison. So two, two measures that work pretty well in PSP. One is the ratio of the pond to the midbrain, and one is um, a measure called the MR Parkinsonism index, takes into account the ratio of the midbrain to the pond and the ratio of the superior to the middle cerebellar peduncles. These middle cerebellar peduncles are typically spared in PSP. And these two markers work pretty well to differentiate PSP from controls and also other Parkinsonian disorders that may overlap clinically with patients with PSP like Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy. So what do we see when we look at the voxel level um, at the whole brain? So on the left of the slide here, I've just um, shown a voxel level map of gray matter volume loss and white matter volume loss in a group of PSP patients compared to controls. So the white matter changes are shown in green and the gray matter changes in red. So the first thing you notice is we see a lot more white matter changes than we do gray matter changes in PSP. And that really reflects the pathology too. The pathology in PSP does target the white matter and you don't see that in Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, you're really seeing changes in the gray matter in the, cort in the cortex. And, much less striking um, changes in the white matter. But PSP, the white matter is really where the money is, honestly, um, when it comes to imaging. So we see um, white matter damage in the superior cerebellar peduncles. You can see that on the sagittal slice running from the cerebellum up through the midbrain. We see um, degeneration of the corpus callosum, this white matter tract um, running on top of the ventricles. And we see white matter um, loss underlying the cortex, frontal, the frontal lobes, typically posterior frontal lobes, and we see some gray matter loss there. So I like this image because I think it shows really striking, strikingly this sort of almost line of degeneration that you see in PSP, starting the cerebellum and going up to the cortex. And that's, I'm trying to highlight that in the image on the right with the blue. Um, so I've highlighted the cerebellum, that little circle that is to, that's where the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum 
would be. Um, and then the superior cerebellar peduncle comes up from that to the midbrain. And then you have connections to the thalamus and then from there to the cortex. And really this whole network here in blue is what we're seeing degenerating in PSP. And you can see that here on the voxel maps and also on some of the other imaging metrics that I'm going to show you. We've looked also at FGV PET in um, PSP, and this actually came up when we were writing the, the new diagnostic criteria for PSP. How well does FGG perform in, um, in PSP compared to MR? Um, so on FGG, we see very similar patterns to what we see on MR is the main message here. Um, in the top of the slide here, I've just shown uh, what's called HIV maps. So it's an individual PSP patient, and the, the regions of metabolism have been converted to Z-score compared to age and gender match control. So what you're, anything bright is worse, um, hypometabolism, than um, darker areas. So first you see is relatively mild hypermetabolism. You're in the blue-green area, but we do see hypermetabolism in the frontal lobe, particularly posterior regions of the frontal lobe. We see hypermetabolism in the midbrain, which is unsurprising since we see a lot of atrophy in the midbrain, and also in the thalamus and the basal ganglia. So very similar uh, picture to what we see on MR. The thing we like about FTG, of course, is we do get these really nice individual level maps for patients with PSP, which can be, which can be more helpful diagnostically than an MR, honestly, especially when they can have some quite subtle um, findings. So people have looked at how well does FTG perform diagnostically, and people have done things like, well, what if we look at a visual assessment of how much frontal atrophy there is? Does that help differentiate patients from Parkinson's disease? They're really always looking at these other Parkinsonian disorders as the comparison group. And what happens if we look at um, metabolism of the midbrain and both of those perform like relatively well to, to differentiate PSP from these other Parkinsonian disorders but not great. I think what has generally worked better is considering the whole pattern. So if you do a visual assessment and you're looking for the pattern of PSP, you're looking for frontal, midbrain, um, thalamus, basal ganglia, seeing that pattern that help, that performs better um, than looking at single regions and there's been automatic, automated um, pattern detection techniques that people have used that have also performed quite well and given good um, sensitivity and specificity for differentiating PSP from other Parkinsonian disorders. So we've done some um, diffusion tensor imaging analyses in PSP. Obviously, I think this is a really great technique for PSP because we are seeing a lot of white matter damage in, in these patients. So on the left is um, from relatively old study now, track-based spatial st statistics analysis of PSP compared to control. So the tract that we looked at is in green and the red shows the regions of um, either increased mean diffusivity or reduced fractional anisotropy in the patients with PSP. And you see that we are picking up these same regions that we found in our group maps. We see um, degeneration of the superior cerebellar peduncle, which you can see on the sagittal image there. We see degeneration in the body of the corpus callosum. And we also see degeneration of some of the association fibers, such as the superior longitudinal fasciculus and the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. Um, but what we, what I think we, we see here from the DTI and also from the, the just the, doing an SPM analysis of volume is this degeneration along what's called the dentatorubral thalamic tract, which I kind of showed you with that image with the blue running from the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum up to the um, red nucleus in the midbrain up to the thalamus and up to the cortex, this line, this sort of line of PSP that you see on the sagittal images. And the DTI picks that up um, pretty well. In fact, we've done some, uh, recently we've started looking at some tractography studies in PSP and we have um, identified the superior cerebellar peduncle on the right shown in yellow and also the whole dentatorubral thalamic tract shown in orange on the right there. And um, and this is just an example of control on PSPRS subject. And I think you can see how degenerated in this case these tracks are in the patients with PSP compared to the healthy controls. So I think that we're going to get some interesting results out, out of the tractography, actually. And we also find that um, the measures from DTI seem to quite relate quite well to what's happening to the patient. So, for example, if you take the fractional anisotropy in the superior cerebellar Uncle, that correlates well with disease severity in the patients with PSP, suggesting it's, it, it's this tract, this degeneration of this tract is playing a role in, in the disease process. So it could even be a good longitudinal biomarker, but we don't have um, much data on that yet. So because we saw this degeneration of this dentatorubral thalamic tract on DTI and MR, we wanted to look at connectivity 
within regions along this sensitive dynamic tract, uh, do we see reductions in connectivity that match the, um, the structural changes? So we did a resting state fMRI study, and we started off by placing a seed in a thalamus, which is right in the middle of this ventral thalamic tract, and then looked at seed to brain connectivity. So on the left of the image in red is just the um, connectivity mapping controlled or regions that were connected to this thalamic seed. And then in blue and yellow are the differences we saw in PSP. So the blue regions show re reduced connectivity in PSP compared to controls, and yellow show increased. So what we're really seeing is reduced connectivity from the thalamus up to the premotor cortex in the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, also within the thalamus itself, connections to the basal ganglia and also connections to the cerebellum were reduced in PSP. So we thought this really matched very well with what we're seeing on DTI. We are seeing um, degeneration of these white matter tracts. We're also seeing reduced connectivity between these structures. And we did between um, connectivity in the thalamus and our DTI metrics in the superior cerebellar peduncle, suggesting a direct correlation between what's happening with the white matter tracts degenerating and what's happening with the brain functional connectivity. And we saw a similar pattern of degeneration when we looked at a, the basal ganglia network, sort of all fit with the same, um, same message, really, that we're seeing degeneration and reduced connectivity along this set, very characteristic set of regions. So, so more recently, we've started looking at uh, tau pet ligands. So this has been like hugely exciting for PSP because PSP is a for, it's a primary tauopathy. So if any disease, you know, this could be useful for it. We want it to be useful for PSP. Um, obviously, Alzheimer's. Uh, I'll talk about about that in a few slides, a few slides time. But it's also very important for Alzheimer's disease. But for PSP, we had high hopes. This is a for our tauopathy. What we need is a biomarker to show us where the tau is in the brain because everything I've shown you so far, the, the volume, the DTI, the resting state, those are all just um, sort of biomarkers of what's happening but not of the pathology, right? We really want a, a biomarker that can show us where the pathology is in the brain. So at Mayo, we've been looking at the ligon flotalcifer, which is also called AB1451. Um, in PSP, we've been looking at it for a number of years now. So this is what we see. On the left side of the image is just a, a raw SUVR image for a healthy control and a patient with PSP at the bottom, the typical Richardson syndrome. And we see um, elevated uptake of the ligand in, again, a, quite a characteristic set of regions. We see it in the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum, which is on the left actual slice there. We see uptake in the um, midbrain, and it particularly co-localizes with the red nucleus. We see uptake in the basal ganglia, which is the third slice over, um, and the thalamus and the subthalamic nucleus. We see some mild uptake in the frontal lobe, mainly in the white matter, but not, not really a lot in, in this um, variant of PSP. And in the top right is just a group map of the same thing. It's just a group map of PSP versus controls. And again, you can see in the cerebellum, we see these two characteristic dots which is the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum, the midbrain in the middle coronal image, basal ganglia. The sagittal image shows the, the midbrain quite well too. So we are seeing tau that's hitting the main, um, main nuclei that we do expect tau in PSP, so that is good. Um, it's also good that we see very consistent patterns across patients and across studies. So I've shown another study actually by James Rowan Cambridge underneath our group map and he finds very similar patterns of uptake in his patients. Um, one, thing, one thing is nobody's really finding good correlations between the tau pet uptake and disease severity. So for whatever reason, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about potential reasons for that later, but it's not really relating to the, the severity of the patients. Um, but we are finding that like, sort of the optimum, the best region when looking at these images is the globus pallidus, which can differentiate the PSP patients from control pretty well with the tau pet images. And a number of studies have also said the globus pallidus seems to be the best um, region on tau pet. So we, I promise you some multimodal, so we, we have started looking at um, correlations between all these different modalities. The thing that led to us to do this study actually is we, we wanted to know, well, to what degree is the tau 
that we're seeing on PET related to all these, these other modalities and these other abnormalities that we see in PSP? Is it related at all? Because there are questions over tau PET imaging in PSP, which I'll get to um, at the end. But so we wanted to know how well is it related? Um, so we did a, um, a sparse canonical correlation analysis which looks at pairs of modalities and sort of picks out correlated, I'm not a biased statistician, so I'll give you my best explanation, picks out sort of um, components of correlated regions from the two modalities. Um, so in A, for example, when we did for calcium perverse um, tissue volume, this was the, the biggest component and we see flotalciper picked up in our usual regions that we see flotalciper uptake in PSP and you can see tissue volume loss or atrophy in these same regions so what we think is happening is that the tau is causing local atrophy of those structures which is what we would hypothesize that the tau that's deposited in the brain is related to volume loss in those structures and this seems to support that um, I can't really see my slides very well because I have this banner going right across it. But I think the next one down is the flotazepur versus the DTI. And here we did see, um, if I can get rid of this, it's just like a banner and it's going right through the slide with the, but I don't seem to be able to move it. Okay, I'll just carry on. Um, so with the DTI, again, the, the flotazepur picked up the regions we always see in flotazepur because that's really all we see. But we did see it related to some DTI changes, but a little bit more distal. They weren't really local or next to the regions of tau, but some um, DTI reductions in the frontal lobe, regions we do see in PSP, but, but a little more distal to where the tau is. And then we also looked in, in D at tissue volume versus DTI. And here we found more local relationships in the frontal lobe. So when we see degeneration of um, like reduced FA, for example, in the body of the corpus callosum and some frontal tracts that was related to volume loss in the frontal tracts. So I think it starts to build a picture of perhaps what's happening in these, in these cases. We could hypothesize, we don't know, maybe tau's being deposited in these, in these cerebella and um, brainstem regions, which is leading to volume loss of these regions. That's then disrupting the the white matter tracts are leading to degeneration in the frontal lobes, which also then leads to atrophy of the frontal lobes. I mean, you could you could spin it probably a number of different ways, but I think it, it does show that there are relationships between these modalities within the system of what's happening in PSP, and the tau pet does seem to be related to that system, which is uh, which was good a good finding for us. So one thing I wanted to point out about flotalciper is that, and all the tau pet ligands really that we have at the moment, is that they were developed to bind to tau in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so you see, and they work very well in Alzheimer's disease, there is a big question about how well they are binding to tau in PSP, but I wanted to show you what the difference is between a flotalciper scan in PSP and a flotalciper scan in an Alzheimer's patient, which is on the left side of the slide. So you can see the difference in the Alzheimer's patient, tau lights up throughout the entire brain. And this is quite a young onset Alzheimer's patient. We see a lot in young onset AD. Throughout the whole cortex, we're really seeing tau uptake. And in PSP, we see a lot less. We just see our little cardinal nuclei, perhaps some subtle, um, subtle uptake in the frontal lobes. So you could argue that flotalciper would be great to differentiate PSP from Alzheimer's disease, and for sure it would, because PSP, uh, I'm sorry, Alzheimer's disease really has a very strong signal on tau pet and that's not the case in PSP. Um, but then there are a lot of differences between AD and PSP pathologically too, perhaps in the amount of tau burden in the tissue, um, less in PSP than Alzheimer's. So there could be some biological reasons, but for whatever reason, Alzheimer's disease for tau works great and you see less in PSP. And we also started to look to see, well, what happens over time in um, PSP and flotalciper? Could, could it be a disease biomarker where we could track patients and look at flotalciper uptake and, you know, use it in a clinical trial, for example? But when we, um, we did find some changes over time in the pallidum, the midbrain and the precentral cortex with uptake increasing. But when we looked at sample size estimates for clinical treatment trials, midbrain volume just blew flotalciper out of the water and was still the best biomarker longitudinally. So I don't think we're going to get anything at this point from the tau pet ligands currently available, um, maybe in the future, but midbrain volume is still your best bet for tracking patients. We also started to look at correlations between flotalciper and tau burden in, in patients that have died now. 
to see that, you know, are we seeing any relationship between what we're seeing on the tau pet and, and what we see at autopsy? Um, there was a couple of studies published in cortical basal degeneration degener patients which have the same type of tau as Alzheimer's and people just in individual cases, and they did find correlations between flotalcipur and um, volume loss across regions in these two cases, which is shown on the left. Then on the right, we actually did a group study where we looked across within region across patients, was there a relationship? And we did see some relationship in the midbrain and the red nucleus with the tau, flotalcipur relating to tau burn, but not in the other regions. So there's still a big question mark over the flotalcipur and what it's really binding to and what it's telling us, but we're, we're still investigating it. For the last maybe five minutes, I wanted to talk to you about other PSP clinical variants. So everything I've shown you so far has been the typical PSP Richardson syndrome, which is the most common variant of PSP. But we, uh, for a number of years, have recognized many other different clinical phenotypes of PSP. Because remember, PSP is a pathological diagnosis. And just the same as Alzheimer's disease, it can present in slightly different ways in different patients. And then the criteria that we published in 2017 really was the first step to try to make diagnostic criteria for these other variants so they can become, they can be studied in research. Um, so this on the right gives you some of these other variants. I don't expect anybody to remember any of these, but just to give you a flavor, I mean, for example, you can have um, PSB patients that present, present with a predominant speech and language disorder, but then later develop the features of PSP. And we've actually done a lot of work in these subjects because we have grants on speech language patients as well, which overlaps. Um, so that's PSP SL. You can have patients with PSP that present with a lot of behavioral abnormalities. Um, so those are called PSP with a frontal presentation. So almost like behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, but with PSP features as well. You can have patients with PSP that also present with the cortical basal syndrome features, or you can have patients with PSP with a progressive gait freezing or a predominant Parkinsonism. You have some patients that start like Parkinson's disease and eventually develop the features of PSP. So just to give you a flavor of what these different variants really mean. So the question then became, well, what happens with imaging across these different variants? Can these brainstem biomarkers, for example, that that are uh, used clinically for PSP, can they be applicable for these PSP variants? And what do we see in the different PSP variants? So we've actually just finished this study that we've just submitted. So this is this stuff is unpublished, but hopefully it will be published soon. We started looking at these brainstem measures across the different PSP variants. So these are just box plots. On the left is just midbrain area. Then we looked at PONS midbrain ratio in the middle and the MRPI, this, this MR Parkinsonism index that takes into account the PONS to midbrain ratio and the superior to the middle cerebellar peduncle. Um, and we see similar findings across the three metrics. Um, so, for example, if you look at the midbrain area plot, controls are on the left. The next group is the PSP Richardson syndrome, our typical PSP. And then after that, you have the different variants of PSP. So, the thing to notice is that. Um, many of these variants were abnormal compared to controls on the midbrain metrics. So in some ways, that's great news because perhaps these, these midbrain me measures could be useful clinically you know, across these variants. But we see a lot of variability. So, for example, the patients with the speech language presentation had a lot less, which is the third box plot along, had a lot less um, atrophy of the midbrain compared to the typical patients. And the patients with the PSP, P, um, the predominant Parkinson, they had less too. So I think there's a lot of variability that needs to be taken into account when using these biomarkers, be the overall message from, from this slide. We also looked at a lot of, we've looked, done a few studies now, we've looked at other modalities across the variants. And I showed some FTG images on the left because it's just individual patients, but it really nicely shows the variability you can see in the, what's happening in the in the brainstem and also what's happening in the frontal lobes across the different variants of PSP. So for example, the typical variants at the top, but then you can see there's a few variants that do have quite a lot of cortical damage, such as the speech language variants, which is a third row down, and the cortical basal variants, but other variants that don't show any cortical um, involvement really. And we also see variability of how much midbrain hypermetabolism we see across these variants. And as you would expect, we see variability in the DTI metrics as well. We did see um, a few regions were affected across all variants, like the body, the corpus callosum, and the superior cerebellar peduncle, actually. So again, suggesting some utility for some of these measures across variants, but also variability, with superior cerebellar peduncle, most affected in the typical PSP, and the um, body of the corpus callosum, most affected in the speech language. So again, 
there's variability and we're going to have to deal with that when we start thinking about how to use these imaging measures as biomarkers in clinical trials, how to enroll patients with the different clinical variants of PSP, how to assess them clinically too. Should you look at the midbrain? If it's, if it's not atrophic, does that mean it's not PSP or it is PSP? How do you use these biomarkers? And this slide really just shows that we see the same thing in tau pet. This is tau pet uptake patterns across the different variants. And again, the speech language variant, the third row down, shows a lot more flotalcifer uptake than the other variants. So, and we see variants across vari variability across other regions as well. So we put together this little um, this little schematic for our paper, just trying to illustrate this, so that you can sort of think of this as like the map of PSP, the circuitry involved in PSP. And you start at, for example, at the bottom of the plot with the DM, the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum. You know, you've heard me talk about this for a while. The last twenty minutes, the superior cerebellar peduncle going up to the brainstem, and then you've sub cortical nuclei in the cortex. But what we're seeing is the pattern of involvement across these regions is what's varying across these different PSP variants. So I think they're targeting the same network, but you target different parts of it depending on how you present. Ultimately, at the end of the disease course, if we follow these patients, we might find that they all converge and involve the whole of this circuitry, but we haven't done those studies yet. But at least when they present, we're seeing differences in these patterns. So my last couple of slides, the, the other thing that's important to us as a field is pathology. Can we use imaging to predict that a patient has PSP when they die, right? Um, so in our midbrain study that we just did, we looked at this because we had, I think it's about 41 patients that have died and they were split between patients that had PSP at autopsy and patients that did not have PSP. PSP at autopsy and the, the legend shows you the other diagnosis, but there were various other diagnoses. Most of them are cortical basal degeneration, which is another for our tabopathy. But either way, so we looked at our three midbrain measures and said, well, are they different between those that died and had PSP and those that died and did not have PSP? And the answer was they were. They were pretty different between the two groups. And again, I've shown plots for midbrain area, pons midbrain ratio, and MRPI. And we found that the MRPI actually performed the best to differentiate these groups with a sensitivity of 83% and a specificity of 85% to differentiate PSP from non-PSP. So that's pretty good. I mean, that's, that's not bad. So I really suggest if a patient comes in and they have midbrain atrophy, that really is a strong predictor that they would have underlying PSP. Some caveats to note in this study is that we had an imbalance in the clinical variance across these two pathology groups, right? So the ones that died with PSP were mainly the typical Richardson syndrome, which do have the most abnormal midbrain biomarkers, and the ones in the non-PSP group were the, some of the variants that didn't have the most abnormal um, biomarkers. So it might reflect reality, honestly, because when you see a patient with PSP Richardson syndrome, at least in our hands or Dr. Joseph's hands, nearly nearly all of those do have PSP pathology. It's the other variants where the pathology can be less um, certain. So I think it's still, I think it's good. I think it suggests possible utility of the midbrain measures, but we do still have to be careful because clinical variant plays a big role in that and how well things are gonna predict pathology. So um, really to summarize all that, I think neuroimaging has really helped characterize the, the pathophysiology of PSP, provided biomarkers that can be useful clinically. I think the brainstem MR biomarkers particularly, perhaps the FDG could be useful diagnostic tools. Although I, I'll stress that when we were putting together the diagnostic criteria in 2017, we didn't feel that the evidence was strong enough to make any of the imaging definite, you know, like you have to have it to have a diagnosis of PSP. They were just supportive features. So that says something. Right? Um, the DTI and the resting state, I don't think we, we have any real diagnostic markers from them as of yet, but I think they've helped characterize the abnormal patterns of structural and functional connectivity in PSP. So we've learned about the disease. And I think there's evidence from multimodal studies that we do see um, breakdowns in all these modalities. They're all related to each other. The abnormalities do occur across the PSP network variants, and we need to be mindful of that. The tau pet, I think we've got a ways to go. We need to understand the biological underpinnings of the tau pet. Autoradiographic studies have actually shown little or no binding of flotalcifer to 4R tau, which is obviously a big problem. There could be uh, issues with autoradiographic studies, though. It's still open for debate. And we see off-target binding in healthy controls in the midbrain, in the basal ganglia, which is a problem for PSP because those are the reasons we, we 
you know, see abnormalities of PSP. There are some second generation ligands that have, work has been presented now show promise, um, but I don't think any of them are completely without off target binding and none of them have really gone, had enough patients die to prove that this is really binding well to 4 tau. So I think there's still more work to be done. We still need a definitive biomarker of tau pathology in PSP. And I think we also need to work towards using all these modalities to help us um, generate better biomarkers for PSP. We've got MR biomarkers. We, we, we know DTI is a big component of PSP because of white matter damage, but we need to find a way to put this all together, consider PSP variants, and then come up with better biomarkers in PSP. And that's where I'll stop and I'll just thank um, my neurogenitive research group, particularly um, Keith Josephs, who sees all our um, PSP patients, and that the whole team and our NIH funding, as well as Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals, because they provide us with the AV1451. And that's it. I can take some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. That was wonderful because it started with really the fundamentals and, and uh, then really took us into actually quite a lot of detail with some of the variants and, uh, and the different modalities, as you said. So uh, it's, it's a huge area to cover. Um, I mean, I'm actually going to cheat slightly uh, with the time allowed. I'm going to start with the first question, um, which is to say that I'm in a, in a way it splits into two parts because I'm very intrigued by the challenge, obviously for PSP, but a whole range of, of similar or, and different neurodegenerative diseases. The combinations of measurements and the challenge of putting them together is tricky. It's tempting to get into measurements, you know, mm -hmm. and ratios of measurements, and you, you've summarized some of that, and looking for a bit of clarity, you know, amongst midbrain measures, perhaps. Which, so one of my questions as part of this is, which ones do you think uh, rank at the top, and how would you how would you go about the process of prioritizing? And mm -hmm. if I could then sort of piggyback on the on on that, whilst you know we are not, um, I mean we're not we're not an AI company or something. Uh, you know, our methods have been based on neuropathology and various uh, uh, deliberate sort of uh, investigation of, of, of anatomical changes. But, uh, you know, AI seems to me is, is one way in which one can start to sort through what the ratios and combinations of measurements should yeah. be. So I wondered what your sort of thoughts are on that. And finally, <laughs> the process of the process of dealing with how do you come up with diagnostic criteria? And you've sat in a room with, you know, experts in the, in the field. There's mm -hmm. the human element of what, you know, how much consensus do you find there is and how much, you know, how difficult it is, is it to reach agreement? So all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I've got it. So the first one, um, you know, I'd love to say tau pet, but we just don't know enough about it. And we're not really sure it's binding to tau to be our, our go-to biomarker at the minute. So I would say you've got to have MR in the mix because the midbrain volume really is, honestly, still probably the best we have, but I really think we could get something from DTI because the white matter is just so affected in PSP. So I, but the, like you said, the problem with trying to merge together DTI and MR, like it's one thing doing a ratio of midbrain to pons, but trying to do a ratio of a DTI metric to MR or trying to find some combination is so difficult when they both have completely different scales and different things to consider so I, I know we've talked a lot about how could we put these things together to make a useful biomarker and and it kind of ties into your AI question because like we would love to be able to do AI too and we had that in mind for a, a, a project that we, we want to do that we want to try to find a way to put these things together and use AI we're not AI experts either but we want we want to get into that one limiting factor is always the number of patients that we have you know so we we have about how many PSPs do we have now? Maybe like in the order of 120, 140 with MR, but not all of those have tau pet, you know, so it's really the end, trying to get enough subjects to have the power to run the AI. I think that's one problem. The second problem in my mind is how we then take AI and turn it into something a clinician could use. Right. You know, I, that's not... I mean, I'm I, like I have no ex really experience in using AI, so maybe people that do know how this step happens, but it always seems a bit black boxy to me. We ran AI and this is the best thing, but then how do you make that into something a clinician could use? And we've talked a lot about trying to make something like super simple that a clinician could use. Well, I think clinicians are starting to look at the midbrain, and I think even recently we found that the radiologist did output for us a midbrain and a pons ratio. We're like, oh wow, I didn't know they were even doing that. So it's but for a radiologist to output something that's given to a clinician, it's going to have to be 
either just an algorithm that can easily be applied or just something that can be easily done, right? And that's the challenge. And especially when you put more modalities in, then you want the radiologist to take the DTI, measure something, compare, you know, yeah, we've had a lot of discussions about it. How do we, we make the next best biomarker? And I'm hoping all this work we're doing with variants is going to lead us there because we're learning more about what is most consistent across the different variants and potentially could be the most useful and how to merge those. And the last question, uh, consensus. <laughs> um, yeah, that's very difficult. And even after the diagnostic criteria were published, I mean, we then started to apply it and then found all these holes and problems with it. And, and I know that they, they published more criteria to help people apply the criteria. So it, it's very challenging. It's very challenging to come up with diagnostic criteria. And obviously I was, I felt like I was listening in to most of it because most of it was the clinicians, you know, talking about the different clinical features. And as an imager, I, you know, contributed to the imaging part of it. But even then we felt like we didn't have anything definitive enough to say, if you have midbrain volume, you'll definitely have PSP. There's so many caveats and that's why it wasn't included. But yeah, it, it was very tough to come to consensus across the field. And I think at the end, you end up with something that maybe not everybody is even completely happy with, but you've ended up, you know, you've had, yeah, you have some louder voices that drive certain parts of it. And then, I don't know. <laughs> the process, the process of com a compromise I guess yes it kind of ends up a bit of a compromise I think and um, as to what's in it and the test is then applying it you know and seeing well how does this really work this criteria was very different from previous criteria and it really was a research criteria it was designed to help researchers categorize these different variants of PSP right. in a standardized way so I think the test will be as more papers come out and people apply it and um, how well do we do across centers in applying it yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, so talking of uh, loud voices, let's see who else has a question for you. Ian, how appropriate. Are you, are you going to jump in? Ian has quite a lot of AI. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so, I, I do, but, um, but that's not my question, Stephen. Um, hi, thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, I'm really interested by the idea. So you're saying that all of these variants may well be affecting the same the same network and, and might end up in the same place on some extent. Like, mm. How likely do you think it is that it's sort of fundamentally a bit random where it starts? Um, and if, that, if, it, if it is that, I guess it's all sort of a similar kind of condition, but the treatment is different because the symptoms are different? Question mark. Yeah, it, that's like the, the big question, isn't it? Like why? Are they starting in different parts of this network? And you can ask the same question about Alzheimer's because we see the same thing happening. You have atypical variants of Alzheimer's disease, and I, I have a grant that follows those patients. And by the end of the disease, Alzheimer's patients again probably involves most of the cortex, but they start in what we what we think they start in very different focal areas, and we really don't have a good explanation for why they're starting there. Why is a is one patient started, PSP patient starting with their speech at the top of the network and, and coming down perhaps. I, I don't know. I don't know whether it, it is random or whether they're, yes, I don't know. I really wish that we, we need to do more work in that. People have started looking at how we think tau is spreading through the brain. They're thinking, well, is it spreading like prions through the brain tissue? And people are thinking maybe it is, but why it's starting where it's starting? Um, we we just don't we just don't know. But what was sorry? What was the second component of your question? The first bit was about random where um, it starts. It, it, yes, thank you. So the same part was simply, um, you know, when it comes to the, uh, the the reason for differential. Obviously, research um, is very important. But when it yeah. comes to clinicians, are they are they looking for help working out how to help these these people? Because if it's in different areas, it's going to have a different impact on their lives. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yes, I, I mean, I think, yes, we do need more help in almost predicting what's going to happen to these patients. Right. I think that's sort of what, what you're getting at. Like if we had a patient yeah. come in with a speech language disorder, how will we know which patient's going to become very PSP like and die with PSP? And how do we know which one is not or is going to go the other way and die with with a different disease? We did a study on that recently, actually, because we do a lot of work on the speech language variant. We looked at PSP and CBD uh, pathology. Um, and we did find some differences on imaging. For example, the ones that died with PSP did have slightly smaller midbrain volumes than the ones without. So I think there is potential for the imaging biomarkers to be 
used at that early stage in some of these atypical variants to help us predict which ones are, are going to go along that path. I think we're not quite there yet. And I think people are still um, just recognizing that, if, for example, the patients with speech language could become PSP. Just getting that message out there, I think the criteria has helped that. So I don't know when whether clinicians other than us who are used to these, these issues, whether when patients see a speech language disorder, whether they're even thinking about PSP or even looking for that, they're probably more likely trying to help them with their speech problems at the time, you know, maybe speech language therapy or, um, I mean, unfortunately we don't have really a treatment just like Alzheimer's disease, well, we, we don't really have a treatment for PSP. So it's not like we're trying to predict who would have PSP so we can give them the better treatment, but perhaps that might be the case in the future, right? And then we really need, there's even more push to know earlier which patients are gonna end up with PSP. So I have, I have another question, actually, again, kind of linking in some ways AD and, and PSP. So I was mm. intrigued. You talked about the relative lack of correlation between tau pets and severity. Um, mm. I thought that was quite interesting because the impression I have from, from AD is that they are reasonably closely coupled. So yeah. I wasn't sure if that reflects that the, the tracers are not ideal for um, the full repeat tau in, in PSP, or is it that actually the, the tau itself is not that strongly linked with um, yeah. clinical presentation in, in PSP. It is, do, you have, do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I mean, it could be either. You're right, in Alzheimer's disease, there's a much tighter correlation, and it could for sure be that tau is, the tau is, is actually binding to the tau much better in Alzheimer's disease and PSP. So probably the most likely explanation is it's not binding great. It's not binding all the tau, could be one explanation, or it's not binding to the tau at all. I mean, we hope it is, but um, the, it's still a big question mark. The other thing that could be happening, of course, you could have sort of a, a, a lag between, like even in Alzheimer's, we see that. So we see the tau deposition, um, and then you'll see the, the atrophy, the, the MR changes, you know, probably a, a little later in time. So you'll get your tau deposition that will lead to your atrophy, which will lead to your clinical symptoms. So there could be a temporal lag to consider between the tau and the clinical features, right? That might be why the, clinic, the clinical features are, relate better to the volume loss and the degeneration of the tract, but it's still possible. Well, we still think the tau is causing that. It's still possible that the tau ligands are measuring the tau that's causing that. So it could be it could be a combination or either of those things. I, I, I'm not sure. And do you, yeah. and do you think the diffusion um, changes would be in between those two things, in between the tau and the macroscopic atrophy? in PSP or? Uh... Um, that's a great question. Um, but the thing with PSP is, you know, the tau is, a, you do observe tau pathology directly in the white matter. So it, it, so right. it's quite possible that it's targeting the tracks first, which is leading to atrophy. Um, I, and I also, I don't know how to almost get at that question because when we see a lot of these PSP patients, they already have um, you know, florid disease, and they it's, it's hard to get them early, it, is my point. One one thing I've thought a lot about is whether we can use the speech-language patients to actually look at the earlier stages, because there we, we actually see these speech-language patients, and it could be five, six years before they develop PSP. So that could be our opportunity to really start, you know, doing some temporal ordering of, of biomarkers, a bit like what we people have done in Alzheimer's, because you have MCI, and you have hip um, positive normal controls, you have all these early phases in Alzheimer's and it's a little more challenging in PSP, but I, I think we'll have to use these, these variants. And although it also then gets complicated because these speech language patients have degeneration of the frontal lobes and regions because of their speech language. So you have to sort of dissociate that and try to look at your PSP regions. And I wonder if we could do it in those patients and start to look at the ordering. Because I think it's a great question and it, um, the DTI could be the first, the, the tracks could be going down first. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, to follow that, I think I would bet on the on the diffusion microstructure, perhaps preceding the the atrophy. Um, yeah. and it'd be interesting to, interesting to consider if there's a grey matter signal as well, which of course is what we're what, what we would look at typically as well to complement the white matter. Yeah. Um, I mean any. Sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say the DTI has just been a bit more challenging also to get like individual numbers from patients, you know, to really turn it into a individual level marker. You know, MR is so much more straightforward and you just measure your area and there's your number. The DTI, 
I don't get a sense of whether it's just going to be more challenging to turn it into an individual level. Um, this is more variable, you know, like to, when you look at the individual level data to turn it into a biomarker. But I would think there's a lot of signal there. Yeah, there are definitely challenges with the variability, but well, hopefully we have a paper coming out soon, which will address uh, some of our findings in, in PSP. I don't know if awesome. Mario, you need to comment or ask a question. It's a good segue. You're muted still. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. I, I have a quick question. Uh, currently, which biomarker or combination of biomarkers best differentiate PSP and uh, cortical basal degeneration? Mm. That's an interesting question, too, because, you know, I think the least amount of work has been done to look at biomarkers differentiate PSP from cortical basal syndrome. Like most of the studies look at PSP versus PD, PSP mm. versus MSA. And there's when I've written these reviews and things, I've really found a lot less that's looked at cortical basal syndrome. Um, and the challenge with cortical basal syndrome is they, they have a lot of cortical atrophy. So you, I, I don't know is the simple answer. There really has not been a lot of studies that has found an optimum biomarker. I would say probably the MRPI might work pretty well. We found actually, we did a, an autopsy study comparing PSP and CBD with the flotalcipa. And we did find very good separation actually between them using a ratio of the globus pallidus and the red nucleus because we see tau uptake in the red nucleus in PSP and we see tau uptake in the globus pallidus and a bit in the motor cortex in CBD. And actually a ratio, we, we did another ratio, the ratio of those two things really separated them well. That was an autopsy set, but, and, and the thing is, Glottasper still has a lot of question marks over it, but we are seeing different patterns that gave us pretty good differentiation, you know? Um, what we haven't done is apply like some of those brainstem markers to PSP versus um, CBS. We don't have a big cohort of cortical basal syndrome patients, but we, we have some. Um, but it is a bit of a, a gray area. Less people have looked at that, but we need more people to look at it to differentiate the two. Thank you. Mario, you, we also found, and Mario led the work, but we also found a combination worked pretty well with some of our measurements, but also some of the very much the standard measurements. But it, again, it was, as you yeah. said, it was quite a small, it was quite a small uh, uh, data set of, of autopsy confirmed uh, subjects, that is. Um, yeah, I think a combination probably, uh, it makes sense that a, yeah. a combination is what you're going to need. Consider the midbrain, consider the white matter, cons you know, consider these nuclei that are targeted in these two different diseases. But yeah, I'd be very interested to see your paper, so do send it to me when, it, when it's out. Sure we will. Um, uh, I think maybe we've got time for one more question. Would you agree, Jennifer? Okay. That okay? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Oh, uh, that always puts a lot of pressure on the, on the people asking the question. <laughs> one or two more questions. Who else would like to sort of ask a question? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, uh, Dimitri, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Um, so given that there is so much variance, spatial variance uh, between the different PSP variants and um, PSPRS, uh, an ideal biomarker for you would keep, would measure what is more consistent across variants and what, what would that, um, what other parts that are not consistent, non-consistent between variants would um, what would you do with the with these parts? Um, I don't know if my question makes sense. I think so. I think what you're saying, yes. I think if we could, if we found things that were abnormal across all the variants, then yeah, that could be useful for you know like a clinical trial or a diagnostic biomarker because you know it would hopefully nearly always work, right? So if you were, had a patient come in and you saw midbrain atrophy, you could be, even if they have different variants, you say, well, yeah, it's still very likely to be PSP, or if you don't see it, not likely to be as PSP. So yeah, I agree that we've been looking at that, like what's consistent across the variants, and there are some consistent features. I mean, I was actually surprised in our recent study that we did find abnormal midbrain metrics across most of the variants. I didn't think we would actually, but most of them were abnormal, but a lot of variability. So I think we still need to do a lot of work to figure out 
take those those things that we find that are consistent and then really see how they would work in real life and if we were to use them as for example a longitudinal biomarker we haven't talked much about turning these things into longitudinal biomarkers but that's really important too and we don't know a lot yet about how these clinical variants change longitudinally and what are rates you know when for clinical treatment trials you really want to rate because you want to be able to track it over time and look to see how it changes um does that does that help or was there a second component of the question uh yes it helps um yeah my, um my main question was like you know would be the non-consistent um across variants, uh, you know, like atrophy, for example, regions, spatial differences that are non-consistent, would that mm -hmm. affect the overall um, biomarker that would measure overall PSP uh, pathology? So, so would they contribute to, to overall uh, pathology or the ideal biomarker would just keep what's consistent between variants? Mm -hmm. You mean, would it be helpful to consider the differences as well as the similarities? Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. I mean, quite possibly. I mean, the differences could also be helpful to differentiate these variants. That we, I haven't talked too much about that. We have these diagnostic criteria, but could imaging help at all in differentiating the variants? I don't know. I I don't know the answer, but for sure, understanding the differences and the similarities, I think is is crucial and I, I don't know how to I can't see a clear way to use the differences to feed into a biomarker but quite possibly that I mean, could be a ratio we talked a lot about ratios and you know ratios between different regions and things I, I just don't know it's it's clearer in my mind how you take similarities and, and say well maybe this biomarker will work but um I don't it's not so clear in my mind how we take the differences but for sure I mean I think we need to consider all of these patterns to understand how best measure it i mean maybe an ai technique that can look at everything you know and really um draw um similarities and differences and, and use that would be powerful we'll we'll, we'll ask ian to get on to that shall we yeah um, <laughs> um actually I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna pounce on the comment you made just as a very last very quick question which is what on the longitudinal which i think is fascinating mm. and i agree we need to get a handle on it what's your best What's your, where, where would you put your money? Do you have a do you have a sense of which which shows the best signal so far? <sighs> Probably just mid brain, like it just you know mid brain yeah. volume. Um, we've looked at rate of mid brain volume change in PSP. When we did that tau pet study, the the rate of mid brain change beat the clinical metrics and it beat the tau. I don't have a good sense of longitudinal DTI. I haven't really done a lot of longitudinal mm. DTI. We did try actually. We did a study of longitudinal DTI and it, it was a little tricky. It was tricky to get a clear signal. I think it was variability. It just wasn't quite as clearly, you know, giving us a clear biomarker, but it should. I think it should. So I think, but we haven't, I haven't done a lot of work personally on the longitudinal DTI, but it should. Longitudinal mm. superior cerebellar ped uncle, you'd think. The problem with the superior cerebellar ped uncle, though, it gets so degenerated in PSP that sometimes you can't measure it at the second mm. time point. Yeah. Um, it's so thin. I did a study years ago where I placed ROIs, you know, on the tracks back in the day before we had TBSS. And I remember them just being just so thin. Uh, so that's going to be a challenge. Yeah. So, it, so, it, yes. so I, I sort of I sympathize with your view. So you, like brain stem, mid brain, uh, because that tracks reasonably well with severity, right? Is that what would be your guess in terms of longitudinal? The superior cerebellar peduncle, you mean? Well, just you, yeah. you, when I said which which you thought was the strongest signal, yeah, you were saying some of those measures, basically some combination of those measures, because yeah. they also track severity. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And the the midbrain metrics are so tried and true, you know, and then we really do see yeah. change over time. That's nice. It's still our probably our best biomarker, I think. But but again, taking combinations of regions could be powerful. And, and, and merging DTI into that. I think there's still a lot of work. The more I talk to you, the more I realize there's a lot of work that needs to be done to find the optimum longitudinal biomarkers. But for now, I think just taking a midbrain volume is, um, you know, I don't know of anything stronger than that. Yeah, fair enough. Say. But I know studies have looked at it and might find different. I know there are some studies that might have found combinations of different regions might perform. A bit better but i'm not sure if it's anyone's found anything that's really been taken on by the field mm. you know it's, that's, it's totally that's sometimes another challenge of its own of course isn't it in a way yeah 
um, uh, well, we'll, yes, we'll continue to work on it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like, there are a lot of studies and they find, well, if you combine this, this and this, it's better. But the thing is, and then another study says this, this and this. And, and the problem is, how do you then sort of get the best one of those and people start looking at it? Like the MRPI has done a good job because people have started looking at that measure because it's, you know, it's relatively easy to measure. But mm. And same with AI, you might get a combination of things. Someone else might get a different combination. How do you then turn that and it becomes something that does go in the diagnostic criteria? One yeah, day. and then it, then it becomes a question of, of how do we get the consensus view from that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, absolutely. But I mean, this and this this spans across other conditions as well, of course. Um, yeah. So so we probably we should wrap up, uh, Jennifer. But actually, with, with okay. exactly that thought, I mean, from our point of view, uh, it's been uh, wonderful to have a bit of Q and A and discuss uh, all the information you've presented to us because we are looking at a range of neurodegenerative disorders and you know all the time I guess we're thinking about just as we've said different patterns and kind of where the true breakpoints are because I think there are you know there are yeah. there's clearly a continuum in some respects but but there are obviously some some uh, some boundaries as it were and looking for those different signature patterns is is, is a challenge but but hopefully yeah. we get very positive results so um so really uh, thank you very much uh, Jennifer uh, for everything Great. you've presented to us today well thank you for having me it was a very interesting discussion, so thanks guys.